Our next speaker is Dr. Mor Rahimi. He is a specialist of artificial intelligence. We have few centers in the world competing in that field. You have Elon Musk, you have Google, and you have Dr. Rahimi. He has, he has a PhD in electrical and uh, computer engineering. Thank you, Dr. Nozari. It's an honor and privilege to be here. This whole time I was sitting in the back, assuming after that talk, how am I going to give you guys as excited? So I'm going to stop assuming and trying to assess the situation. Um, my talk today is about artificial intelligence, um, more specifically about human-machine symbiosis. Um, nowadays, uh, we talk about artificial intelligence, different aspects of it, um, topics ranging from its capabilities and also many would arrive at human level intelligence or even hum superhuman level intelligence. Today, I want to make a point that as we make machines smarter, we may just have a chance to create smarter human as well. And in order to do that, we need to uh, create an interface to our brain so that AI can interact with our brain. With that, the outline of my talk is going to be, first I'll show you some, uh, how do I get this? First I'll show you guys uh, some capabilities of AI. Um, and show you guys what's the status of AI as of 2019. And then I talk about some uh, measure, measuring methods that we do for measuring mental states using artificial intelligence. And then I take a deeper dive into the technology behind uh, artificial intelligence. And finally, I'll leave you guys with some direction as where we are heading in the near future. Is this, uh... Okay. So here I show some uh, are the videos playing. This is supposed if you press a tab on it. Um, okay, so here's I'm showing I'm showing some videos here. On the top left, you see a speed intelligence example of artificial intelligence, where the recent robots can actually um, assess the situation more than thousand times per second, something that is beyond human level performance. On the top right, you see application of information surveillance reconnaissance, where AI in real time can assess up to 1,000 objects in the scene in a video signal and reason about where the people are, where the objects are, and what are the people in the scene are up to. On the bottom left, you see an application of AI in gaming. Nowadays, AI agents are playing game against each other. As a result, they have long beaten human performance since 90s uh, and in the recent years in the game of Go, which has board positions more than atoms of the universe. On the bottom right, it's the new, it's the most cutting edge artificial intelligence where AI is now able to hallucinate. For those of you in the, uh, that, um, would like to have a, uh, be a good dancer, but you're not a good dancer. You can always pick your perfect artist and just rotate in front of the camera and let AI imagine how you would look like if you were dancing like that professional dancer. Or the best example of AI nowadays is a self-driving car, which uh, there is a tremendous amount of money being uh, thrown at it, and we are able to detect uh, lanes, reason about the scene, detect urban objects, um, detect signs. This is actually in wheelchair. This car drove 80 kilometers without a single interruption of a human. And um, it was such an impressive uh, job. So with that, I want to jump into my favorite topic on artificial intelligence, which is uh, the uh, application of artificial intelligence in mental health. Um, in order to have a good symbiosis between human and machine, we should have a good understanding of what mental, status, mental states are. Mental states is usually defined and, and, and influenced by our behavior, mood and affection, belief and perception, and cognition, all sorts of uh, elements in the cognition, such as relaxation and focus and the amount of usage of a working memory. To, for the sake of this talk, I want to focus more on the cognition side of the story and talk to you guys about how we're going to use AI to assess the cognitive load of human being. So what is cognitive load? Nowadays, imagine we have more than 80 billion um, uh, neurons in our head. Each one is creating an electrical signal around our skull. We want to find a way that we can capture this signal and reason about it. And with, uh, with the help of neuroscience and, and the artificial intelligence, we have been able to actually dissect these signals into different um, uh, frequency bands, where each frequency band is dominant 
when you're up to a certain task. Let's say, if, for example, if you're in deep sleep, then the, your delta band is most dominant. Or if you're awake and doing the routine stuff, then your beta band, which is, which is uh, frequency between 14 to 30 hertz, is most dominant. So the goal is to get these uh, signals and send it to some module and, and achieve something, some gauge that tells us what's the cognitive load. With that, I want to start show you guys a demo of this device that I'm wearing. We call this in our group Fitbit for the brain because we want to monitor our brain on a daily basis and assess our cognitive load. And this cognitive load is influenced by our attention level and meditation level. And uh, if we switch the, uh, to a demo, hopefully this is working. Um, oh. I'm using my phone. This is a problem with the uh, live demos always. So now I'm going to share. That's my sister's baby. OK. Now I'm sharing with you guys my attention level and meditation level. Hopefully I'm having some attention. Yeah, you see this here. And this is up on the right, you see on the top, you see the different bands that are being extracted from my head right now. And you can see the dominant band, the frequency bands. You have the radar chart on the, right, on the left side, which shows the focus of the, which band is being dominant. And these two gauges are, this gauge is showing my attention level right now. And thank God I'm a little bit relaxed and meditating too. So. Now we can switch back to the presentation. Actually, I don't need to wear this anymore, so you guys see this. OK. So imagine the, the possibility if you have access to something like this. As Andy mentioned earlier, uh, this is a performance arousal level uh, curve, where on the, when you're relaxed, it's like a you know, monk uh, meditating, you're most likely on the left side of this curve or when you're composing a music, you get closer to the high performance uh, and higher arousal level. At the Olympic champion is probably at the most uh, performance at the right uh, arousal level. And you certainly don't want to be in the top right. Especially there are many different stressful jobs, such as surgeons operating. Uh, um, they tend to go fall in, in the right side of this curve. Our, our goal is to acknowledge when you go beyond your, uh, your uh, availability, your performance uh, is being decaying because your arousal level is being too much, and assess that and try to bring you back for, to achieve the highest performance. With that, um, this is the technology that we are developing. It's, we call it Assistive Intelligent Machine, and it's basically assessing, uh, it has a perception, it, it listens to your brain signals, and it, it uh, uses some neural network me me mechanism, which I'll explain in a little bit, and as a result, if your cognitive load is saturated, it tries to decrease it by some form of intervention by stimulating your nerve or having dif uh, different methods to bring it down. Now, this can go beyond individual. Uh, uh, the cognitive load assessment can go beyond individual. It can be at the team level also. This is an application that we are working on in the e-gaming where uh, right now they're using all, kind, all sorts of uh, methods to, to improve the uh, player's uh, performance. Right now, for, for the next sake of this talk, I'm going to focus on the EEG signal. This is an example of in-ear EEG. They basically plant this in-ear EEG into the headphones of the players, and they listen to their head, and then try to see whether somebody is saturated, and they can perform better or worse if, they, if you give them more task. Now, this would, be, this would have a very good application in the team sports or, or even in the operating room. For the, for the surgeons, imagine if before you enter the operating room, you would have access to the cognitive load of the play, people who are involved in the, in the surgery. Somebody might have some personal issue and cognitive load of that person might be uh, skyrocketing. And you don't want to have that person as your partner during the surgery. Um, this would be a very effective thing. So this is an example of uh, uh, the same thing in, in the game of uh, 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 now ready again. In, in, in this game, it's a very popular game where five people against, play against five. And this is the view that you see. This is also supposed to be a video on the, right, on the left side. The person who's playing this game would have access to all his teammates' cognitive load. And as you see, those are the cognitive load of the, his teammates. 
And this is the player right now in the bottom left. And as they're playing this game, you can see, if you turn the volume up, you see something is happening. And, and as a result, you see somebody is not doing well. And that's because the quality of that person is saturated. This can actually help. He's so far back. Look at this. He's playing so safe. He knows he could be a target. Cannot be found. A few more attacks will knock down. Inhibitor to the flash for Liquid the play. Not going to get anything for themselves. Goody blocks off a little bit. Here comes the cataclysm. And it could be just that. Third for person in the left. They're forced to retreat the realm war. Because they believe it's such a good And that's the person is not performing very well. The damage comes through to Vex's turret. This is now ready. OK. OK, now let's take a step back and Talk about artificial intelligence. The simplest form of explaining artificial intelligence is that the AI is a system that can perceive information from nature and have some inference model, and based on that inference model, try to act. The simplest form of AI is a thermostat at home. So it senses the temperature. You can set the inference model for the threshold, and when the temperature reaches that threshold, it either turns the AC on or off, and that's the, that's the act that, or the plan that it does. And like any science, uh, uh, scientific project, AI would abstract knowledge using, like in this case, a microscope. I'm making the example of uh, uh, cancer cells. Um, and it tries to create feature vectors out of these cancer cells. And at the end of the day, end of the day it tries to create a line to that separates the cancer cells versus the normal cells. So the core technology behind this is in the, how the AI does the pattern recognition. And this pattern recognition throughout history has gone through different phases. So in the AI, we call it three phases of AI in this pattern, that does the pattern, pattern recognition. The first phase was handcrafted knowledge. Do you see these examples in the TurboTax example or any protocols that if this, something happens, then do this. There is not much learning going on. It's a very definitive way of teaching robot how to do things. Uh, which this, the beginning sign of this uh, technology was about like 50, 60 years ago. And then we got into the learning mechanism. So the machine learning came in. And we, we were able to give the ability to the AI to see the world and learn. And then the third phase is the abstraction, is when the AI is actually not only learning, it's able to reason about the, the nature, which is, that, which is what all humans, humans do. It is a human level intelligence. Today, I'm mainly going to focus on the machine learning part of the story, which has occupied most of the artificial intelligence as we know it right now. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is, consists of three different uh, elements. One is supervised learning, one is the unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Unsupervised learning is when you give information to the robot, and you assign a label for it. You give a cancer cell image, and you say this cancer cell image is a cancer, and you give another image, and you say this is a normal, uh, normal image. So you provide labels to it, so the, the, the robots can actually reason about what, what are the patterns that belong to each class. Another, another class of, uh, another element of uh, machine learning is uh, unsupervised learnings. These are for the cases where you don't have labels for the data. You have to use methods such as clustering and uh, methods that doesn't require one-to-one -one mapping between the labels and the data. The third one is the reinforcement learning, which you, in, instead of uh, providing the labels or the clustering methods, you just teach the robot what's good, what's bad, and you let it go and, and it would learn on its own over time, over experience, experiencing with the nature. If it does something good, it gets rewarded. If it does something bad, it gets penalized. And by try and error over time, it basically try to, uh, becomes an intelligent element. Now, something happened in the, in the last couple of decades that boosted AI technology, which is not necessarily ex explicitly these guys. I want you guys, I want to point out what those factors were and have a little discussion on those topics. Three things happened. Neural network algorithms was introduced. Computing power was increased. And massive data was available. I'm going to go into th these three different uh, points. And th hopefully that would give you guys an um, explanation of why we are today and why we we'll, we'll see the intelligent level that we see today from artificial intelligence. So let's start off with the neural network. Neural network is a, is a or I should say artificial neural network, is a computing unit in uh, electrical engineering and computer science, which, which, would, which is a mechanism to learn from nature. Back in the 1960s, Frank Roosevelt 
came up with the idea of he wanted to use the concept from uh, simple human neurons and create an artificial version of this for learning method. Just the same way as a single neuron would collect information from dendrites and has some saturation level, and once, you see, once it saturates to a certain threshold, it shoots the sig uh, signal to the axon, he mimics the same exact, th exact same thing artificially. So given an image, we extract different cues from this image, information such as color, shape, size, and so on, and we create a neural ne artificial neural network uh, to, to make a classifier out of this. How does this work? You have those information goes, uh, go into each node, and each one is weighted. For example, if, if, I'm, uh, if the AI is about to classify the um, images, maybe the color is the most informative thing to classify between the cancerous cell versus non-cancerous cell. So then you see the W, the weight of the color might be much higher in this here. Or, or it could be the size is a more, more, much, uh, more dominant factor in classifying this thing. So this is the weighted sum of these cues that you see in this uh, uh, neural, artificial neural network. And once they get summed, it goes through some nonlinear uh, function, which as a result, the Y would tell you whether it's a one or a zero, whether it's a cancerous or non-cancerous cell. This was called back in the days perceptron. Many of you might have heard this. This created such a big uh, hype back in uh, 60s or 70s, and people thought that they solved the intelligence problem. This was up until, so this is an example of perceptron again. Perceptron is a linear classifier. And what it does is imagine each data point is a one data point from each uh, self, uh, Im Im image of, of a cell. And the job is to create a line that separates out the, the good cells versus bad cells. As you can see, this is a linear model. That means you're separating two data sets with the line. Or if you're in the 3D space, you're separating it with the plane. This was glorious days until Marvin Minsky came and published a paper 10 years later and proved that there is a major uh, problem with these perceptrons. And that was the fact that you couldn't simply separate out two uh, data sets of uh, green circles and uh, red crosses with a single line. And with that, he began the AI winter. At the end of 70s, AI winter started, and, and it went on until early 2000s. Even though that he, he pointed out a problem about linearity of the linearity issue of the perceptron, somebody else, Jeff Hinton, actually didn't give up. He decided to solve the problem. He decided to create an uh, artificial neural network that could actually uh, use nonlinearity in, in, in the model. So he started with the perceptron, and he simply just added another layer as a multiplier. Think of this as, is, as perceptron would be y equals x. This is why he calls x squared. And simply with that, he introduced the nonlinearity to the neural network structure. But the problem is, in order to, um, to model nature's nonlinearity, we actually have to have a huge structure. We cannot just have a two layer. We should have layers, hundreds of layers with thousands, millions of parameters. And in order to actually do something effective, you need to have a huge computing power, which wasn't existing back in the 80s. So no matter how, much, how hard he tried, he could never actually be successful until early 2000s, where the computing unit, the, 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 uh, the computing power was at the level that could address this kind of computation level. So what happens? We went from CPU to GPU. The, pro the difference between CPU to GPU is that CPU, think of it as a serial processing, which most of our computers would have, and GPU is a parallel processing. And it would, it, with that change of uh, uh, concept, we boosted our uh, uh, computing power significantly. And in early 2000s, that's when Jeff Hinton could actually use deep neural network, and that's where we see lots of different good examples, which I show in the beginning in the AI. Now, uh, obviously, data came in with the era of internet. But I want to uh, point out, go back to the, um, the, the AIM topic, artificial, uh, the assistive intelligent machine. Now, AIM is, is an AI system which assesses your cognitive load, and it either uh, informs you that your cognitive load is too high, which I showed you uh, in the beginning, or it can actually have an intervention, and it can actually stimulate you to bring your, uh, to, to, to calm you down and bring you to the right uh, arousal state. Or it can actually intervene in terms of uh, 
in getting involved in the, in, in the game. Let's say you're driving a car and you're about to fall asleep and the AI would realize that and it would kick in the self-driving uh, mode and, and takes the control from you from crashing. In this example, it's an example of playing game of, game of Pong. You uh, think of uh, you're playing against computer, which is a red dot, and you are the light blue, and, and your partner AI is the dark blue. If you're doing well on the top, we can see that the signals are not as high frequency, so my, my cognitive load is pretty low. And AI will sit quiet. It doesn't, do it, it doesn't intervene. But the moment that it sees that my cognitive load is being high, which as, as you can see in the score, the score of the, AI, the computer is 10 to 1, then it tries to help me out. It gets involved and tries to be a, have a form a partnership with me. OK, so how does it work? in more details. I promise not to go into too much details, but think of it as, as, as a simplest way of explaining this is that uh, the, our brain signals get uh, uh, collected. We dissect these signals into different frequency bands. We send these frequency bands into a very deep neural network structure. As you go deeper into this neural network structure, think that you're abstracting different knowledge from this uh, signal. If I'm explaining an apple, maybe I can, uh, the first layer would say the apple is red or it, it describes the color of it. The next level would describe the taste of apple. The next level is uh, describe the smell of it. So we have this EEG signal. As you go deeper and deeper into this uh, neural network, we keep extracting different cues from this uh, uh, signal. And at the very end, we make a classifier which shows the gauge of where your, where your cognitive state is. And with that, oh, this, is my, this is almost the last slide. I want to point out something that we are heading in the near future, and that's visualizing your imagination. This is the technology you're going to be seeing in the next 10 years. Just the same way as, uh, as human uh, um, neurocortex uh, system, when we, when we see something in, in our uh, uh, visual cortex, the, the, the information gets abstracted into in different layers. We want to mimic the same thing, but in the reverse way. So we get that EEG signal, we decode it with those you know, uh, uh, neural network uh, structure that when you're thinking of the car, we can display you a car. And we have tremendous amount of success doing this right now. As of right now, we are at the point that we can, the computers can actually hallucinate on their own. And as a result, you see, can we click on this video, please? The clicker is not working. What you see here is a result of AI hallucination. This is the hallucination about the horse, hallucination about the kitchen, hallucination about the living room, hallucination about the motorbikes. None of these images have been existing. This is all purely hallucination. We use 220,000 images from the scene to teach each concept to, to, the robot, to the AI, and we ask him, now nah, hallucinate something new for me. I tell you hallucinate horse for me, hallucinate horse. I tell you hallucinate cars, we would hallucinate cars. And we are very close to connect this hallucination, to control this hallucination with our minds. That's the part that is still missing. We, this is the uncontrolled hallucination. Very soon we'll be able to use our mind, use our brain signals to control this hallucination to that, so that when you think about something, precisely that thing would occur. Uh, okay. Oh. The applications of this are vast. You can have an application in military, you can have an application in medicine, sports, and uh, our goal at uh, AIM is to provide this Fitbit for the brain for everybody. We want to empower people with a device that they can assess their cognitive load in real time and try to have some form of intervention, either ask for AI for the intervention or inform them for themselves to do uh, the better job. And uh, with that, I want to end uh, with my favorite quote that says, Throughout history, we have used our mind to build and improve things. Soon, we'll be able to build things that improve our mind. Thank you. <laughs>